Hi, I'm Rebecca Diaz, co-moderator for today and augmented and virtual reality strategist for Z Prime and Frolic. Like Manoj mentioned earlier, 2020 has not been an easy year for many. However, in other ways, it has allowed us to think critically and adopt our own innovations. Here to talk about how 2020 has been a pivotal year in, in the energy industry is Steve Lusso, Director of Executive and Executive Chairman of Seagate, and Aaron Hardick, the Senior Research Analyst for UAI. Aaron, please take it away. Thank you, Becca. As Becca just mentioned, my name is Aaron Hardick. I'm the Senior Research Analyst at Utility Analytics Institute, and I am joined by one of the technology industry's most influential and visionary leaders, Steve Lusso. Steve, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. And I'm a little bummed, Steve. I put on my cardigan in true FDR fireside chat fashion, and I was hoping that you would also be wearing a floral cardigan, but I guess <laughs> sometimes it doesn't I misplaced happen. my floral cardigan this morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So we're not here to talk about cardigans. We want to talk about tech and meeting climate change goals. We're currently still in the midst of this pandemic, but I think one of the things that brings a little bit of hope is to talk about the silver linings of the pandemic. Off the heels of the election during this pandemic, what do you see as one or two silver linings that the tech in, that would affect the tech industry and the average citizen? Yeah, I think you know that's it's the right way to think about it, and it's always kind of hard to think about you know what comes good out of things that are are you know for the most part super challenging and have created a lot of death um but it's life also and that's kind of what the world presents us is what the world presents us and and we have to reach in and, and react to it in a positive manner and, and move forward um and i think that's probably the biggest silver lining which is this pandemic happened in a time where i feel many of us uh, at least many of the elites, many of the people who you know live at the level of society that we do, um, we're starting to believe that we were kind of in control, and uh, which is a it's a dangerous place for humanity to be to have this arrogance to think that we're in control, and I think the pandemic, and I and I say this, and you know some people this will resonate with, and some people will think it's a little, you know, California ish, but. I think in a lot of ways, this was the Earth's way of just saying everyone slow down and pay attention. Um, this pandemic, you know, didn't just come from nowhere. In fact, you can tie it to climate change. I mean, a lot of the habitats that have been ruined have created the situation where these, you know, experiments that happen in nature every day are now getting closer to humans and, you know, they're going to jump. And so I think the number one silver lining lesson is that it's forced us to realize stuff can happen that is quite significant, that is unexpected, and that we don't have instant answers for, and it should. And therefore, we can either be super uncomfortable about that, or we can recognize that as a reality and conduct ourselves in a manner when these things continue to happen, we go to the point of what do we do to, to create something positive as opposed to being beaten up by it. Um, I think it's also shed a light on a lot of issues um, that people have been talking about for a while. You know, people talk about Bill Gates saying a pandemic has been coming for 10 years or whenever that famous speech was. And, you know, nothing was really done or certainly not at the scale that we needed it to be done to react to it. And that's true. But on top of that, for 25 years before that, the medical community has been talking about our chronic health issues mm -hmm. and what happens if we don't address our chronic health issues or what if we don't address the way that we take care of the elderly and the facilities that we put them in. Um, and uh, or what happens if we don't address the disparity in education. And, and so all of these things now have shown how kind of fragile they are. And the pandemic has basically delivered that for us. So I think the silver linings are in part, um, yes, it's been terrible and painful and loss of life, and, but it's also a wake-up call. And, and I know many people have said this, I think this is actually the wake-up call 
for climate change in a lot of ways. Like I, I tell people, like, if you don't like the pandemic, you're really not going to like climate change. <laughs> and we can get into we can get into some of the whys of that. But a lot of it is this temporal nature is as long as this eight months has been, it's only eight months and we've worked hard and collectively humanity will deliver a vaccine and, you know, we'll sort it out. Um, we won't have that same luxury with climate change. Um, the, the solutions will take longer and they're going to be much more complicated. Absolutely. So I think, uh, you know, those are kind of, I think one other thing I'd like to say is the other thing that it's done is it's allowed um, an acceleration of addressing some of these needs that we've talked about. So um, for example, I'm on the boards at, at AT&T and Morgan Stanley. Um, so a lot of, you know, the corporate um, activities around addressing the pandemic have really been spectacular and they don't, you know, beat their chest about it. But for example, AT&T has gone to all the major communities that they do business in and they've really led the organizational efforts around supply chain, PPE, what happens on the next one, you know, so that there'll be a mechanism in place that we can hopefully respond quicker. Or in Morgan Stanley's case, you know, it was just the, the first big bank to issue uh, a bond that was basically going to be completely dedicated to investing in ESG um, um, projects. And, and I think, you know, things like that, you know, probably wouldn't have happened on the same pace that they did. Um, and again, that's, that just shows the power of, of the positive side of humanity reacting to these things. Right. And as it relates to technology, so I wanted to talk, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the silver linings of technology. Technology has really played a role in how we changed our behavior throughout the pandemic, both in our personal lives and work lives. What impacts do you think technology will have in the long term? What changes of behavior do you think will stay in place maybe after the pandemic? that came about during well you know i mean we can kind of start with the probably ones that are most in front of our minds as a result of us doing this conference this way you know i think the whole you know where what is a workplace and how much time do we spend in what type of workplace and what are the implications for the underlying technology to do that what does it mean for the travel industry for commercial real estate you know etc cetera, etc cetera. i think all of that um has fundamentally changed uh, in a way that it wouldn't have without this, at least not when it did. And it doesn't mean that there won't be some return, you know, to more travel and more in-office experience. But I think the curve that we're on now is, is you know, materially different, and it's going to stay materially different from whatever trend line it was on. And underneath all that is technology. I mean, the, you know, the tools that we have today, um, you know, for contact tracing, you know, for doing the mRNA work that we've been doing to have, you know, the, the type of telecommunications um, experiences that we have, you know, they just really weren't there even a few years ago. And so in that sense, I think we were quite fortunate that in a lot of ways, we've been able to continue to engage with economic uh, and social growth um, without the entire system shutting down where it very mel well may have, you know, 30 years ago. Um, supply chain efficiency. I think this really, you know, put a light on, you know, how many people do you have going into a place to produce a good or service and how many do you really need and how do you balance that between um, those people and technology and, how about the technology to let you work at home? So it was really interesting. So at Seagate, where, you know, we make stuff um, and, uh, you know, it's not software. It's not money moving all over the world. It's, you know, we have to make a hard product and we use elements off the periodic table. And, you know, we didn't have the luxury to say 90% of the workforce stay at home. You know, those people had to go into work and, you know, had to be in labs designing products and building products. Um, what that did, obviously, it forced us to rethink how many of those people do we need and other ways that we can automate even more and not have them at risk. But the other thing that it did, and I think it did for a lot of manufacturing companies, is it, it, it created, I think, a rebalancing of value in that, um, 
you know, I think people had historically been trending towards the person in the factory kind of isn't as important as, you know, the, you know, the, the R and D person or the salesperson and it's certainly not compensated the same. Now, luckily at Seagate, we've never really believed that, but you know, when you think about the people that have to go into work to keep the plant running, wow, those are pretty important people. Um, and so it's, I think, and, all, and oh, by the way, no one had contingencies in place. So those people ended up working a ton of overtime because they had to be there and there was nowhere else, you know, they couldn't go and take a vacation or whatever. So I think it's allowed people to say, how do I compensate those people differently? How do I make sure that there's some redundancy and backup in those positions? And how do I make sure that I understand the entire supply chain? so that I know where those risks are for my business, either downstream or upstream. And so as a result, I think the overall economic system is gonna get a lot more efficient. By the way, it'll also have implications of which countries are you in or not. And that's all gonna have a technology base that has to you know, provide for some sort of seamless um, activity. I think Zoom will be a Zoom, you know, I'm using a product name, uh, you know, uh, uh, a virtual uh, r remote communication tools um, are going to advance like we won't believe. Like I, I can't, you know, think about five years from now, we'll think back to this experience and think like, oh, you remember what, how kludgy it used to be or it wasn't 3D or the camera didn't follow you around the room. So I think, you know, all those things are going are gonna to continue to advance. Um, I think education is another one that we've now seen um, how we can use technology to deliver a different education system. And as long as the technology is available to a wide demographic, maybe a fair education system. And I'm, I'm not promoting taking kids out of a classroom because I think that social engagement is important. But I think this one made it clear that we're not balanced where we need to in terms of who has access to technology if we really want to run a, a, a free and open society that's got equity and equality. And on the other hand, if we can deliver that infrastructure, I think this will allow for an educational experience that is more sustainable, richer, and has a much more forward looking um, uh, aspect to it. When you think about long-term, you know, physical campuses are going to disappear just because of the cost of them. Well, what are you going to replace them with? So I think, how you think about the technology that delivers, delivers education, what does that interaction look like? Um, all of the social science behind how long could people be in front of screens and still be learning, I think that stays with us. Um, work, you know, I've seen a bunch of studies uh, of, of the major companies that I sit on boards of, as well as the smaller ones. They're all surprisingly consistent about what back to work looks like and when. And I don't think it's group think. I think these are pretty independent. But, you know, all of them kind of say even in two years, maybe half the people that used to go into the office will go into the office. And maybe that means one or two days a week, two or three weeks a month, as opposed to five days a week, four weeks a month. So I think that's a shift that's going to be pretty significant. Again, what's the technology implications? You have to have access to all of your, your data. It has to be secure. It has to be private. Um, it has to be mobile. Um, and your home kind of has to have the same levels of protection that your, you know, your workplace does. So the technology implications are quite significant. And um, you know, I think those are the, a few that, that really kind of stick out for me that where technology is, is going to is going to play a, a key role and, and, you know, learn a lot. Um, the shift, obviously the shift to um, large scale, hyperscale delivery of products and services was accelerated by this. Um, and I, I think that in, you know, in some ways in good is good. And in some ways it's unfortunate because the pressure it's going to put on small business owners um, and the employment related to small business owners, which is quite significant in our country. Um, so I think that's one where we have to rethink what does that mean about how that wealth is, is spread. Um, and I think the travel and leisure industry is, we've got some real challenges. Um, I'm involved with a couple of high level restaurant people. And again, they've used it as an opportunity to rethink how do you use technology 
to do a big commissary engine uh, kitchen? How do you have menus that can change quickly? How do you get delivery out there? Because they're going to change their models not to be so dependent on a physical space, you know, with people. And then obviously all the things around medicine and biotech, um, you know, have, have been spectacular. And, you know, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, you know, we've, we've now developed, you know, technologies inside of a year that, you know, used to take five or six years. Yeah, the acceleration of innovation has certainly been a silver lining during the pandemic. And we have a lot of utilities watching today. And I think they would relate to what you said about at Seagate, you guys had to have people coming in and building these hard pieces of hardware utilities, you know, they have to have people in doing certain jobs to keep the lights on to keep the water running during the pandemic. So it's been this kind of tension between providing these basic services and doing what you have to do and figuring out how to mesh, mesh that with innovation and trying to adapt to this accelerated pace of innovation. Yeah, that's right. And I think the related point to that, especially you know, I think it goes for both the people that have to go in and the people that were able to continue to do their jobs remotely. And I think this is one where a lot of, um, you know, business leaders and investors have, have, in my opinion, maybe not got it completely right, which is how do you calculate <clears throat> how much of that was um, achievable because of the goodwill that's been built up over five, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, so, you know, Seagate is a company that, you know, probably a lot like the utilities were, you know, our, our average employee has been with the company 18 years. And, you know, yeah. so it's not, you know, a startup where every two years, everyone's leaving. I think the utilities are very much like that. And there's a loyalty to that, that comes with that. There's a cultural understanding. There's a lot of unwritten knowledge that, you know, builds in an organization like that. And that well, of knowledge and goodwill um, has benefited companies like ours dramatically because it's there. Now, if you get into a remote mode for too long, you know, how do you replenish that well, I think is, is a big challenge for people. And I think people have gotten a little bit too optimistic of, oh, see how great this remote stuff is. We can just keep doing this forever. Um, and I think the answer is, well, yeah, but you had a big advantage on the first one that you may not have uh, carrying forward unless you really focus on how are you going to continue to build culture and institutional knowledge in an environment that's a little bit more remote. Um, and that's hard to do. I mean, because it's never been done before. So it's not going to be as easy as bringing people into training programs and, you know, having them be part of the team. Right. I know, I know that the institutional knowledge retaining that has been a big concern within utilities. And we could talk about this all day, but we do need to shift gears and talk about climate change because we have about 10 minutes left. So what is the catalyst for the overall awareness followed by action that we need to meet climate change goals? Uh, you know, this is where it gets really hard because uh, I, I try and remember the words of Sir David Attenborough and, and remain positive. Um, you know, I think, you know, again, if I can contrast this with the pandemic, the, again, you know, one of the good things about the pandemic um, in all its badness is that it was obvious and present and real. <laughs> like it was here, um, we saw hospitals fill up, we saw people die, we're keeping track of how it's spreading. The problem with climate change is, yes, in many, many ways, it's just as obvious, um, but for a lot of people, it isn't. Yeah. And, and so because there hasn't been a sustained wave of, you know, calamities that affect people that they can draw a line to, to climate change, um, it isn't as real. So the, the problem with climate change, as as a function of humanity, and this is where technology hopefully can play a role, is that in a lot of ways, uh, it's, it's slower moving with much more dramatic implications. And humanity, you know, we're, our basic defense systems are not optimized for long-term issues. They're optimized 
for short-term issues. You know, that animal is charging me. <laughs> and, you know, the climate change, while for, for, all, for all those of us that understand the science, it is a rogue elephant coming at us. For most people, it's not. And, and so, because the answer is we're going to have to sacrifice for one or two or three generations. And that sacrifice is going to take the form of living with less, consuming less. Um, so we have a world that is better for our great, great grandkids. And while humans will do that, certainly for their family, I would run in front of a truck to save any one of our children or my wife. Um, and sometimes we do that, you know, for larger communities. And sometimes we do that for nations in times of war, where we sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice for the good of the future. So unfortunately, I feel like until people realize we're at war on this, I don't know what the catalyst is going to be other than it's, a, I think it's a tricky equation. I think you have a third of the people who are pretty much aware of what's going on and that if we don't get in front of some of these issues in the next 30 to 50 years, there are going to be implications. Now, I don't think, you know, by the way, I, this has nothing to do with earth. I, I always said, I want to write a book and, and call it earth winds one to nothing. Um, earth is going to be fine. It's, it's, you know, is it going to be a place that's going to be great for humans? And, um, and then I think a third of the people just don't care. And I don't mean that like ignorantly. I just think they have other priorities. Yeah. And then there's a third of the people who just don't believe it. And, and the question is, how do you get that second third into the first third? So you have an overwhelming majority that says, let's focus on this and get something done. Now, the good news is a lot of people who run organizations that have economic power are in that first third. And again, you no, know, it's easy to, to rail on corporations and even places like big oil or whatever. But the reality is big oil understands this problem better than anyone. And, and, and they have the tools to help address it and you know, hopefully to you know, help us get to a better place. So I don't wanna make enemies out of people who actually have the most resource and the most knowledge to, to move us forward. And I think the climate, um, uh, you know, community has to, you know, somehow create this sense of it really needs to be addressed now. And one of the ways we can do it is with technology to the extent we can get more and more device technology into the world that are picking up data points that allow us to actually not just see the problems, but help us get to solutions. That's how we're going to get in front of it. How do we get new energy sources that are much cleaner? What about what's going on below the light zone in the ocean? I mean, we have people spending hundreds of billions of dollars to go to Mars. And we don't know anything about 90% of the environmental stack of our own planet, which is from the floor of the ocean to the surface. And, and we know we need water to survive. And we know Mars doesn't have water but we're going to make an ocean there, but we don't know anything about our ocean here. Like I find it also nonsensical, but technology can solve that problem. And I think, you know, to the extent that we get more and more uh, IOT devices into people's hands and into homes and into plants, then the accumulation of that data and applying, you know, big data algorithms to it to basically move energy and move water more efficiently um, is helpful. And finally on that point is, you know, we're mispricing everything. How do, you, how do you get people to understand what's happening when it's not reflected in any real cost? In a lot of places, water's almost free and energy is clearly underpriced as a function of, you know, at least, you know, fossil fuel oil is clearly underpriced as a function of, you know, what the long-term consequences are for overall economic growth. So uh, I think we got to get pricing right. Let's talk a little bit about the current investment dynamic, what change is needed in the investment dynamic to create sustainable scale companies or technologies that can help us meet climate change goals? Because we have you know, certain large organizations that are working on these things, but those can't be the only folks working on solving these challenges. There needs to be yeah. other people doing that. It's interesting. You're right. Um, on the other hand, it's super important. Like, I, I mean, unfortunately, again, if you give, if you think about this dynamic of the benefit is in a couple of generations, but the 
the heavy lift is now, that's hard for an investment, you know, kind of. So that's where I think actually these large organizations are playing an absolutely necessary role to front that cost to solve some of these problems. And as they're successful, people will start to see some of the current commercial applications that are, are nearer term. So again, Bill Gates talks about this, like one of the biggest, I think, um, negative consequences of the constant challenge to our institutions of, you know, disregarding science and making fun of people because they have advanced degrees and you elitists just don't get it, is those organizations are the ones that actually are channeling hundreds of billions of dollars to really tough problems that a normal shorter term folks investor is not going to do. If we lose that, I don't know how that gets replaced, but if we keep it, that allows other people to fly under that investment and actually pursue some technologies that can provide commercial benefit. For example, I'm involved in a company that we're developing an unmanned submarine. We're going to chart the, the surface of the ocean all the way to the deepest depths, one to five meter resolution. And, you know, one of the ways that we can get funding from that is we could do pipeline inspection every year instead of every six years. Um, and the reason it's every six years is because it's the cost of the on-surface vehicle. And now it's, does that help the oil companies? Yeah, it helps the oil companies, but doesn't it help all of us that, that we're inspecting pipelines every year instead of every six years? And then from that commercial activity, then we can also maybe come up with, you know, interesting pharmaceutical problems, or, you know, issues or understanding what's really subsurface when we're laying cables that we're not damaging important corals and et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think the funding mechanisms, it's hard to get the venture community. So it's going to have to initially be governments and organizations. Then it's going to be large corporations. And I think once there's enough of that investment, then you'll get more venture. But I will say that, again, the pandemic and the social rights movement that has occurred this year has accelerated board's focuses on this. So while in the ESG space, maybe it's the S&G that right now is acquiring more of the money, it's all going into an ESG pile. And a lot of that will find its way into the E part of it. Um, you know, it had been on a decline up until a month or two to go. And in November, it was $35 billion flowed into ESG funds, which was the largest flow ever. Now, I think a lot of that was probably Black Lives Matter, you know, and things like that, which is great. So if we can kind of continue with that acceleration, because the other question really is, how do we elevate this to the board levels, where board members are saying, what are we doing as leaders to make sure we're accepting our responsibility to make these types of investments for the future and look beyond, is it going to make EPS greater next quarter or not? Right. Well, that actually brings us to our time. Steve, thank you for talking with me today, sharing your insights for the audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'll turn things back over to Becca. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron and Steve. That was a great conversation. Steve, I gotta tell you, thank you for saying some of that stuff, especially about like energy maybe, or like fuel not being at the price point that it should be given the toll that it takes on the earth. You know, the earth will be fine. It's humans that we need to, to worry about. Um, so just a quick announcement, starting now until 12.20 Central Time, we're gonna take a brief stretching break. Up next, we have yoga with Emma Garcia. So put on some comfortable clothes grab a mat and come do some yoga with us. We'll see you back here at 1220 Central Time for more content. <laughs>